She had placed some kind of fecal material in yogurt and had GC beat it. Jealousy is most often seen in romantic relationships as the result of a perceived romantic threat, commonly in the form of a love triangle. When a partner displays interest in another person, jealousy can cause a person to feel low self-esteem, envy, and even rage. But jealousy is not limited to romantic rivals. For some, a partner's display of affection to any individual may trigger jealousy, regardless of the individual's appearance, relationship to the partner, and even age. In today's video, we will explore the case of Erica Stefanko, a woman who was jealous of her own seven-year-old stepdaughter. This jealousy manifested in grotesque abuse of her stepdaughter, who we will call GC to protect her identity. Erica also felt threatened by her husband's ex-wife, Ashley Biggs, who she would help viciously murder. It took over eight years for Erica Stefanko to be brought to justice. Ashley was a 25-year-old Army veteran at the time of her murder. Some years before, Ashley had met a man named Chad Cobb, who she dated and had GC with. After Ashley had her daughter, they split up and she joined the Army. She would periodically keep in touch with GC, but she eventually lost contact with her ex Chad and her daughter. Chad married a woman by the name of Erica, with whom he had three children. Erica was jealous and controlling. She was extremely territorial over her husband, Chad. If he showed any affection to anyone other than her, she would lash out. Chad's mother testified at Erica's trial. We will hear her recount her perception of Ashley and GC's relationship. And had you known what Ashley was doing or where she was once she gave up custody of GC to Chad? She's seen her very frequently. Um, I believe the last time she's seen her was like 2008, and then she exited GC's life for over three years. No so, phone calls, no checkups on her, no nothing. All right. So at some point in time, does Ashley then come back into GC's life? Uh, yes. Tell us about that. I guess Ashley had gone to the courts to get temporary custody. Chad also testified at Erica's trial. We will hear his perception of what GC's life was like living with Ashley. Take note of Erica's strong reaction when Chad mentions having a dinner with Ashley. Mind you, Erica has been divorced from Chad for seven years at this point, but cannot let go of her jealousy. It, it lasted nine months. Uh, that little girl went through hell with, with what was going on. There was... Uh, there was there was abuse. Um, the magistrate put her in the home of a registered sex offender, and it everything just got very weird and hectic and stressful and, and chaotic. And a lot of things kept happening that it's hard to explain. I mean, poor GC would have bruises or, or, or bite marks or tattoos over her private areas and, and horrible stories of being forced to disrobe and, and, and not to mention Daniel grabbing her legs and, and screaming at her, you know, to be quiet, not say anything. When all these things were brought up to the court, it just got, what Trace, to, when it got brought up to Tracy Stoner, it just got very confusing to why she didn't do anything to help the, the, you know, my child. When she came back and we had our first court hearing, I remember seeing her up at the courthouse and it was truly the first time I've seen her in three years. And I remember walking up to her and I extended my hand out and shook her hand. I was like, it's good to see you that you're back. And I told her that how you went about getting GC was kind of messed up, but you know, good you're back. Actually, I asked her out to dinner to uh, Luigi's Pizza down the road because you know, in my mind, uh, you know, she came back and great, uh, you know, and if, if we're going to, if, if, if she's going to be a part of GC life, let's just, let's everybody do the right thing and, and let, let's move forward and, you know, make it work. That didn't happen. Uh, that was my... Did that happen? Uh, no, no, uh, she didn't take me up on my offer for dinner. Um, uh, and, and we continued through the, the, the very, very strange court process. G.C., now 15 years old, testified in court against Erica. The defense opposed G.C. taking the witness stand, arguing that she was too young at the time of the murder 
and was therefore not competent to testify. The court disagreed, noting that, under Ohio law, children over the age of 10 are presumed competent to testify, even if they weren't of age at the time of the incident. We will hear GC recount her lack of memory of her mother and the abuse she endured at the hands of Erica. You didn't know her then, but at some point in time, do you have a memory of your mother? I don't have many memories of her. All right. There's been testimony that you were with your mom and your father. I guess you saw both your mom and father on and off during the early periods of your life, okay? Do you remember that? I only ever remember being with my father. Okay. As far as Erica went, now what do you, how did you refer to her? Did you refer to her as Erica or mom or what? If you remember. I, mom. You called her mom. And what are your memories as far as Erica? Good, bad, or neither? I had a, both. Both. So tell me about that. Why was it both? Some good memories. We I remember going to a dance where we had like the matching dress and I remember I remember having good times, but then I also remember having bad ones. She was mentally abusive and physically. And how was she mentally abusive? She would tell me that if I told my dad what she was doing to me, then she would do worse. And I kind of figure that's like mentally. And you said physically. So what was the physical type of abuse? Um, she would, I remember she would hold me on the ground and she would hit me. And then she also before made me eat dog feces. So let's talk about that. Do you know why she made you eat dog feces? Because she was jealous of my relationship with my father. With, your, with who? With my father. With your father. Chad was convicted of murder in 2013 for the death of Ashley. At the time, Erica was not convicted, however, even though she played a major role in the murder. Chad originally took all the blame for the murder because he didn't want anything to happen to the children. We will hear Chad explain how Erica manipulated the family so Chad would take all the blame. Erica, in essence, used the children as leverage. Do you know why your dad is in prison? Yes. Why is that? Because he did some not so nice things. I'm sorry, ma'am. Because he did some not so nice things. Okay. And is it your understanding that he did some not so nice things to your mother? Yes. If I would have cooperated with the state and gave them the information that they sought, I don't know what would happen, Erica, because I can't understand why she was able to walk out of the police station the same day that we both were put in there. I mean, I got hauled off to jail and she walked right back into the home of everybody and everything that I love. So I can't explain that I can't explain what would happen to her later. I can't figure out how this all went sideways in the first place. Beth Judge came into the county jail when I was in there and said that if I don't plead guilty and resolve this case by every means necessary that I will lose them. And it wasn't just that I'm going to lose them as, as in they're, they're going to foster care for a second, she said that my parental rights would be severed. And it's not only me, it's going to be my parents and my grandparents. And the younger ones are so young, they're, she says everybody likes young, cute white kids, and the younger ones will probably get adopted out pretty quick, but the older ones will bounce around in the system until 18 years old. And after we've suffered with GC, there's no way that I was going to be the one responsible for losing an entire generation of our children. Chad has a history of violence. He pleaded guilty to domestic violence in 2005. Over the years, Chad and Erica made several threats to Ashley's life, whether directly to her or expressed to others. Both Erica's current husband and Ashley's girlfriend at the time of the murder testified about these threats. So you're asking me if he directly threatened her? Uh, not that I know to her person, but uh, definitely in conversation. All right. And what did he say about that threat? 
Uh, he needed her gone. Uh, he made a comment that when it was all said and done that he wanted to keep her skull as a trophy. Did he say that more than once? Uh, I believe he said it on at least two separate occasions. Did he say this in your presence? Uh, yes, he did. The emails you were able to view and or read or were told about, will you please tell the jury about some of those? Um, it was Erica causing threats. You said Erica what? Making threats. What type of threats? Telling Ashley that she would rip her head off, uh, shove it up her butt, um, and that she would kill her. We will hear Chad's own testimony of the night of the murder and Erica's role. The night was June 20th, 2012. Chad drove his truck to his father's work. At this point, Erica arrived driving her car with their children sleeping in the back seat. Erica drove Chad and their children to Ashley's place of work to make sure she was there. This was all the beginning of the end. When they arrived at the parking lot where the planned murder would take place, Erica made a phone call to Domino's in order to lure Ashley. I'm just asking you, as a result of the call, what did you actually do? I left the house. As a result of the phone call that came in, ultimately I ended up leaving the, our residence. All right, and who, was it just you or did you take anybody with you? The girls. Erica showed up. And what, what did you do when she showed up? Myself and the girls ended up getting into the Lincoln. And what seat did you get in? The passenger seat. At that point, what's the next thing that happened? She started driving up to Akron. And where did you go? Uh, she went up to Akron and ended up driving past Ashley's place of work. And where was she working? She was working at a uh, pizzeria place. I believe Domino's. As you drove by Domino's, could you see whether Ashley's car was there or not? Yes, sir. She pointed it out. She ended up pulling in to an unfamiliar parking lot that was close to the turnoff to my grandparents' house. What did you hear Erica say on that phone call? I remember her saying somebody else's name. I remember it was a, a, a Jennifer or, or Katie, and it was Mick something. Like, like how you say McDonald's, I just I don't remember what she said the last name was. And I remember she ordered a pizza. And I remember it struck me as bizarre because she ordered a half pepperoni and mushroom pizza. She was smiling. GC, along with her siblings, were in the back seat of the car while Erica made the phone call to Domino's. The children were sleeping, but GC woke up and heard Erica place a pizza order. She remembers Erica using a fake name, which stood out to her as unusual. She, I can remember her, and I remember hearing it, but not seeing it. And I know she ordered a pizza. I don't remember what she said that was on it. And I can remember that she did not use her name. Do you remember what name she did use? No. Do you know where you were when you heard this phone call being made? In the back of a car. Once Erica made the phone call, she left with the children. Chad was waiting by himself in the parking lot for Ashley to deliver the pizza. Chad will recount his interaction with Ashley when she arrived. Ashley was confused to see Chad waiting in the parking lot for her. Ashley had military training, and Chad knew she wouldn't go down without a fight, so he used a taser to overpower her. A short time later, Ashley showed up. And was she... what was she driving? Her car. You knew that Ashley was on her way there, didn't you? After Erica made that phone call and came over. So you were waiting for Ashley? Yes? Sir, I wasn't necessarily waiting for Ashley. I was stuck there. And so Ashley showed up to deliver the pizza? 
Yes, sir. And did you then engage her at some point in time or place in that parking lot? Yes, sir. And where were you when she got out of the car? I remember I was somewhere on the other side of the parking lot, but as I, I, I was approaching and it made myself known up towards her car. And how did Ashley respond when she saw you there? Worked up. I'm assuming you were not surprised that she was worked up. With everything that was going on, looking back, she wasn't happy to, to, to see me, that's for, for certain. Did you have any intentions of buying that pizza that night? I didn't know it was ordered, and I had no intention of buying it, or buying one. You didn't know it was ordered? I thought you said that Erica ordered a pizza on the phone. Is it fair to say that Ashley did not leave that parking lot alive that night? Yes, sir, that is accurate. At some point in time, did you make a phone call? Yes, sir. And who did you call? I called my wife. Erica? Yes, sir. And when you called her, then what happened? She showed up. Erica showed up. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Chad killed Ashley using a four-foot zip tie around her neck. Her body had evidence of being tased, beaten, and strangled. What did you do with Ashley's body? When I had to leave, I picked her up and put her in the car. Whose car? Ashley's car. What part of the car did you put her in? In the back seat. And when you put her in the back seat, did she have anything on her that, that was placed on her that she didn't have on her when she arrived? Yes, there was. A zip tie. How many? I remember one around her neck. I remember I sh struggled. She, she was heavy to get in the car, but I had to leave. Why did you have and, to leave? Uh, there were some things that happened, and I just... It's hard to explain, but the only thing in my mind at that time was I had to leave and I couldn't leave Ashley there. Erica followed Chad as he drove Ashley's vehicle to a bridge where he would leave Ashley's vehicle with her body inside. After he parked Ashley's car, he entered Erica's vehicle. The kids, still in the back seat, witnessed their dad enter the vehicle covered in blood. I drove uh, home, but not to my house though, I drove to a bridge. I, I didn't know it, but when we were dating, that's one of the spots we used to hang out at. It's just a little bridge uh, not too far away from my mom and dad's property that's just a nice place to hang out. So there, was there some sentimental reason you went to this bridge? It, it, it's, it's our bridge, and, and that's why I drove there. Uh, it's very difficult to explain. After putting Ashley in the car, in her car, was there blood on you? Yes, sir. Was she bleeding? Yes, sir. And did you have blood on your hands? Yes, sir. And was that obvious? It would have to be, sir. So you get back into Lincoln and you go back to Mount Eaton. When you get Back to Mount Eaton, I'm assuming that Erica and the kids are all still in the car, correct? Yes, sir. Chad, Erica, and the children drove to the parking lot where Ashley was murdered with the intention of cleaning up the area. By the time they arrived, the police was already there and the parking lot was blocked off. Once they realized this, they turned around and went to Chad's grandparents' house where they thought they would be safe. So when you, so you went up to this location where Ashley died to clean up and get a phone. Is that right? Yes, sir. Were there cleaning supplies to clean up with in the Lincoln? Yes, sir. And I, and I guess I 
should have asked you, what vehicle did you take to go back to the scene? The Lincoln. And your truck was still where? At my dad's shop. So you drive back to the scene with the cleaning supplies. When you get there, what happens? Or do you get there? Uh, no, sir. We ended up driving past the scene. Why? I remember there was uh, law enforcement there. What do you, when you drive past, what do you do then? We ultimately ended up at my grandmother's residence. Why did you go to your grandmother's house? Why didn't you go home? I'm not sure. Uh, I pulled in the, to grandma's house. Safe space. The following audio is a recording of a conversation between Chad's mother and Erica Stefanko. Chad's mother took the recording without Erica's knowledge and kept it in a safe for four years before turning it over to authorities. We will hear Erica discuss the leverage she had against Chad, the children. She will admit that the children were the reason he took the plea deal during his trial and decided to not incriminate her. She will also admit that if the police knew her actions, then she would be in jail as well. Presumably, this includes GC's abuse and Ashley's murder. She says that you guys are allowed to bring up whoever you want, whenever you want. And I have to give him all his tools immediately or he's going to, how do you phrase it? Tell him what about my involvement with Ashley. He can't like, really function in everyday life if you're looking over your shoulder every second. Every time I hear a siren, I think they're coming for me. And that's, that's something that I'm going to live with, but I don't need him to contribute to it. And I'm not trying to say this in a manipulative kind of, manipulative kind of a way. It's just the fact of the matter. And I mean, unless you guys think you have some way that you can take care of them, for him to see the kids, I have to still not be in prison. That was part of the reason, because when he took that plea, granted, I didn't know I was pregnant when he took that plea. But I, at that point, I wasn't even planning on keeping her. I was, I didn't. I totally do not agree with abortion, um, not for the same reasons as him, because I've been through so many miscarriages, it's like, that's not a person, I don't care what you say. Some of the stuff that was going on under his roof, like, that, this is the part that really gets me that I don't think he's like, okay, well, you know, like, today's like, he was, well, I'm here because of you, and it's all your fault. And I'm like, well, geez, but how are you going to say it's all, like, I, I get that if, if everything had been told exactly as it happened, that we both be in prison right now. Erica will now discuss the abuse she inflicted on GC and how she kept it a secret from Chad. There are the only things that he didn't know about at the time was the dog poop thing, which really wasn't dog poop, but nonetheless, same principle. She thought she needed dog poop. That's not us. It's neither here nor there. And it was so gross. Um, and that part. The one I would be like, well, just... Don't be off your dad's ass, but I wouldn't put it that way. I'd be like, you know, don't off your dad so much. Don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> Erica recounts her discussion she had with Chad about how to deal with Ashley in the custody battle. At first, she diverts all the blame to Chad and claims that she only committed the murders because Chad wanted to. Then, later in the conversation, Erica states that Chad listens to whatever she says, implying that if she told him not to go through with the murder, then he would have listened. He executed when totally awry. The way he spoke to me about it, he kind of like practiced to see what would happen, but never actually went through with it. The thing that he and I really like butt heads against is all the books that we did that we shouldn't have, or we could have gotten in trouble. I, there's always something that I would say to him, like, you know what you can do and what you can't. If this is something that you think you can do, then I'm okay with it and I agree with it. If you can't do it, then obviously you shouldn't do it. And I always threw the ball back in his court. I, you know, we would, we would fight about it. Like, I'm like, this, this is the only way the situation is going to go away. He really felt pressured by me to do something about it. I foolishly threw the ball in his court, let him make the determination as to whether he was capable to do something that we should, I should have had the good sense to know you just don't ever try to do. So that's when I'm like, I will admit to my fault in that. It's gonna suck. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's let's do this, and then we'll get back to where we were. 
you know, Mike was like, well, Chad does what he wants to do. I'm like, no, Chad would have listened to me. Chad would have done what I had asked him to do. Chad was doing what I had asked him to do. And do I feel bad about what happened to her? Not really. Do I, have, do I feel bad about what happened to everybody else? Absolutely. Could I want to take it back if I could? Yes, I would. He asked me that. He's like, you don't even feel bad about what happened to her? And like, I'm not going to lie. I don't. Like, I, I don't. In the end, Erica Stefanko doesn't hold any accountability for what she did to Ashley Biggs. She states that she is okay with accepting the verdict if it helps the families feel better about the situation, but not because she played a major role in the murder. It is healing and helpful to Ashley's family and friends. Think of me as the monster. If it is helpful for Cindy Cobb to exonerate her child, for his own actions, by putting the blame on me, it not helps these people, particularly people who are victims. I can accept that. I was most certainly my worst self during my relationship with Chad. I have never been a hateful person. I would never have wanted what happened to Ashley Biggs, regardless of what statements people think that they heard on that tape. And all I can do at this point for her family and friends is to pray for God's peace and comfort for them. However, they need to get it. For my own self, I would ask the court for leniency. I would like to be back with my family someday. I love my children more than life. And my husband does not deserve to go through the rest of his life alone without a partner. At the end of the trial, GC read her victim impact statement to Erica. My view on the world has changed because I now know that I can't trust monsters like you. One day they're supposed to be your mother figure, and the next they're the reason you're crying in a corner hurt and bruised, even at 16 years old. You were supposed to be the woman I could look up to and call mommy. You don't deserve to be called a mother. Knowing the secrets you kept with me, it breaks my heart to know what would happen to my siblings being raised by a devil like you. You didn't like the attention. You didn't like the fact that my father put his children before you. You didn't like you didn't like the fact that I loved my father. You sought vengeance. Erica would hurt me and then scream at me saying, If you tell your dad what I do to you, I will do worse. She studied years of psychology so she knows how to and has messed with people's brains and feelings. Erica Stefanko's attorneys requested to declare a mistrial. They claimed that the jurors were rushed to reach a verdict without properly considering the evidence due to a rise in COVID cases and the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday. The court refused to declare a mistrial. In July 2021, Erica Stefanko was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Do you think Erica's participation warrants a murder charge? Do you think this all stemmed solely from her jealousy and concern for the family, or did she enjoy taking part in the murder? Thank you for watching, and join me next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.